The Douglas SPD Dauntless was a famous dive bomber design that was used throughout World War II, primarily for the US Navy, Marines, and the Army Air Forces. As World War II began, the SPD was not deemed ready for combat. However, the aircraft's participation and success in early battles of the Pacific Theater, like the Battle of Midway, solidified it as a legend by pilots and aviation enthusiasts to this day. In this video, we will be going through each of the variations of this aircraft, starting from its conception up to its final production days. In 1932, future aviation industrial giant and designer John Northrop broke off from Douglas Aircraft to create the Northrop Corporation. This firm, backed by Douglas, would come into its own designing aircraft in their infancy, creating planes such as the 7C Alpha Fast Transport, the Beta Fighter, and the Gamma Mail and Cargo Hauler. The Navy Bureau of Aeronautics sent out a request for proposal in 1934 to aircraft firms for a new purpose-built dive bomber. Northrop would submit a design for an all-metal, stress-skin, low-wing monoplane aircraft, blowing out competing firms such as Brewster, Vaught, Martin, and Curtis. The Navy ordered a single prototype of Northrop's design under the designation XBT-1. Led by aeronautical engineer Ed Heinemann, the new XBT-1 design was state-of-the-art in the early 1930s. As Northrop saw a dive bomber's main design focus on strength. They employed a sparless, multicellular wing structure design, like Douglas's early DC transport planes. A defining feature was the plane's bulging landing gear fairings, with the lower halves of the tires sticking out during flight. As the wings were not designed to be folded on this aircraft due to its structure, Northrop tried to make the plane as small as possible for aircraft carrier elevators and hangars. First flown in August 1935, the initial prototype reached a top speed of 184 miles per hour and was powered by a 700 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R1535-66 Twin Wasp Jr. with a two-blade propeller. Reimagined in December 1934, the XBT-1 was fitted with an 825 horsepower R1535-94 Twin Wasp Jr. reaching 212 miles per hour. The plane, now able to carry a 1,000 pound bomb, had a service ceiling of 22,500 feet. An issue arose, however. The plane would buffet when the dive flaps came out. This was solved by drilling holes in the flaps, later known as slotted dive brakes. With the buffeting issue resolved, the Navy accepted the aircraft in late 1936, ordering 54 now BT-1s for production. Soon after entering service on the new aircraft carriers USS Yorktown CV-5 and Enterprise CV-6 in 1938, the BT-1 suffered debilitating handling problems. In addition to going into an erratic role after increasing engine power, the plane suffered from a lateral instability and loss of rudder and aileron control at low speeds, unfortunately causing several fatal crashes. At this time, the Navy started expressing its disinterest in the aircraft. With a sizable amount of the budget still available from the original BT-1 design, Northrop was able to build a second prototype from the design to address the BT-1's deficiencies. The first change was an increase in power, dropping in a 1,000 horsepower Wright R1820-32 Cyclone radial with an adjustable three-bladed propeller. The second initial change was redesigning the control panel and instrumentation. However, the now XBT-2 proved only slightly better than its predecessor in a mid-1938 test. Working with NACA at their full-scale wind tunnel in Virginia, Northrop was suggested to make the landing gear fully retractable into the wings, increasing the size of the rudder and tail, as well as adding fixed slots to the wings for an increase of aileron effectiveness. After going through 21 different rudder and tail configurations and 12 different aileron profiles over a six-month period, Northrop finally found an ideal combination for implementation on the plane. However, before being tested, John Northrop resigned from Douglas, which was backing the Northrop Corporation at the time. Throughout the legal process, the design was transferred from the dissolved Northrop to Douglas under the new designation XSBD-1. The last major change before the Bureau of Aeronautics acceptance was a cockpit greenhouse redesign and in early 1939, 144 SBD-1s were ordered. 
The reason for the SB designation was the Bureau of Aeronautics acronym update, SB denoting a scout bomber, and the D in recognition of Douglas Aircraft. As production began to ramp up for the new Douglas dive bomber, a distinct redesign of the cowling and the creation of a bulbous carburetor air intake took place. Additional last minute changes to the production model included a propeller spinner, as well as moving the radio mast slightly back in front of the cockpit. Armament was added to the front of the aircraft, installing two Browning M250 caliber machine guns into the fuselage, integrated into the cowling, to be shot through the propeller. The gun breeches were in the cockpit for easy access to clearing a jammed gun. The pilot had a telescopic gun sight that protruded through the windscreen that served for the guns as well as when dropping bombs, like in the previous models BT-1 and XBT-2. A radio man slash rear gunner sitting behind the pilot was equipped with a single flexible Browning 30 caliber machine gun to protect the aircraft from rear attack. The gun was in a storage trough behind the rear cockpit featuring two hinged doors for the radio man to open and sling the gun out. The SBD-1 also carried flotation gear for ditching at sea. The aircraft's payload options included a centerline bomb, weight capacity of 1,600 pounds, and one 100-pound bomb or depth charge under each wing. The main bomb was sit in a cradle that would sling under the propeller arc to ensure no damage would occur to the aircraft when on a dive bombing run. Though 144 were ordered, only 57 were delivered in the Dash 1 specification. The Bureau of Aeronautics was not impressed in this version's lack of armor for the crew and lack of armor for fuel, as well as its lack of range. Not considered combat ready, the plane's 210 gallon capacity gave it a range of 900 miles in total with a bomb load. Two 90 gallon tanks and two 15 gallon auxiliary tanks sat in the main center wing section. This would give the SBD-1 a combat effectiveness of under 200 miles. The first 57 aircraft were given to the U.S. Marine Corps in June of 1940. These planes would serve mostly as a trainer aircraft. The 58th SBD-1 onwards of the original 144 plane contract were designated as the SBD-2. This model would see a service introduction in early 1941. The slated modifications for this update would not completely solve the Dauntless's shortcomings, however. The focus of this variant was to address the plane's lack of range. The two 15-gallon auxiliary tanks were removed, and two 65-gallon tanks were installed in the outer wing panels. Now with a capacity of 310 gallons, the SVD-2 had a range of around 1,200 nautical miles. Due to increased weight for takeoff due to the fuel load, it was known for the crews to take out one of the nose-mounted M2 Browning 50 caliber machine guns for weight savings. Two notable changes to the model were the inclusion of an autopilot for the long stretches of patrol and a reduction of the size of the carburetor air intake. This model still did not feature armor protection for the crew or the fuel tanks. Realizing the destructive power of the German Stuka dive bombers in late 1939, the French were extremely interested in acquiring their own dive bombers for their naval air forces. The French Navy ordered 174 Douglas dive bombers for their use before the fall of France in June 1940. The U.S. Navy, picking up the Orphan aircraft, also ordered 410 additional of the now SBD-3 specification aircraft for their forces. The Dash-3 would finally bring the SBD to combat readiness and effectiveness. In addition to crew armor and an armored windscreen, there was an inclusion of self-sealing fuel tanks for the 260 gallon capacity available in this version. These tanks were placed in the wings. As these up armor modifications would prove to increase the weight drastically, Douglas ditched the flotation equipment and used a lighter Alclad instead of Dural skinning of the aircraft used in earlier variants. A new and similarly powered model engine to the previous models was used, the now Wright R1820-52 radial. As part of this new engine, the two engine ventilation slots on each side of the cowling received a slight change, which was enlarged and included a fixed opening. For armament, the second cowling 50 caliber machine gun, usually removed from the SBT-2, was recommended and officially reinstated to be kept in for combat use. Throughout the production of the SBT-3, the radio man received an up armor 
from one flexible Browning 30 caliber machine gun to two. No longer was a flexible pair covered and stored by two hinged doors. This was updated to a sliding solid panel to get access to the gun storage trough. Many early SPD-3s would be field modified to add the second 30 caliber machine gun. The SPD-3 would enter service in early 1941. Even with the weight savings attempted, the SPD-3 now weighed more than 500 pounds heavier than its predecessors and saw a drop in performance. Top speed fell from 256 miles per hour to 253 miles per hour. However, pilot and aircraft survivability chances increased. In 1940, the U.S. Army took an interest in dive bombing as they looked on to the German Stuka's success in the fall of France. Instead of designing their own aircraft at the time, the Army looked over to their Navy brethren for a new aircraft. Ordering 168 SBD-3As, the internal Douglas build code, for their own use, the Army would have the tail hook deleted as well as the installation of a nomadic tailwheel for land use. All future Army orders of the aircraft would also feature these changes. No other major changes would occur to these now A24-DEs, more commonly known as the A24 Banshee. More than 50 A24s were sent to the Pacific and would see very little combat access against the Japanese in 1942. These would be pulled from frontline service to be used for training purposes only by the end of the year. The SBD-4 coming to service in late 1942, was close in resemblance to the SBD-3. The changes to this version were minor. The electrical system on this model was updated to a 24 volt system instead of the previous 12 volt systems in the previous aircraft. With this new electrical system, the SBD-4 was able to install more modern radio navigational equipment and airborne radar. An electric fuel pump, as well as an electronic emergency fuel pump were introduced to this model. There were two physical differences to the SBD-3. One was the Yagi antennas under each wing for radar equipped planes. Most early SBD-4s had to be retrofitted with radar equipment due to shortages. Later planes would have factory installed systems. The second physical difference was the introduction of a new propeller. A new spinnerless Hamilton Standard Hydromatic constant speed propeller replaced the adjustable pitch propeller and spinner on all the previous models. 780 of this variant would be made, most of which going to the U.S. Marine Corps for land-based use. 170 SBD-4s were built for the U.S. Army as they requested additional units. These would be used in a training role under the designation A-24A. The next iteration of the Dauntless received a perceived welcome change, a new power plant with the installation of a 1200 horsepower R1820-60 cyclone engine, the new SBD-5 would increase its top speed by 7 miles per hour. However, cruise speed decreased. Front end changes included a reduction of cowling flaps on each side to one. All previous models featured three on each side. The engine ventilation slot was enlarged and moved back, and most noticeably, the carburetor air intake was deleted. The obsolete telescopic gun sight was also replaced for a modern reflector gun sight. The design also implemented two wet points, one under each wing, for US standard 58 gallon drop tanks. This would increase the range to around 1350 miles. Produced from early 1943 to early 1944, this would be the most produced Dauntless model, with 2965 built for the US Navy. 615 were ordered for the US Army under the name A24B. 60 of these would be considered surplus and handed over to the U.S. Marine Corps via the U.S. Navy. Virtually indistinguishable from an SBD-5, the SBD-6 received a new power plant as well. This variant would feature a 1350 horsepower R1820-66 cyclone engine allowing the aircraft to reach a top speed of 262 miles per hour. Another change was the removal of metal fuel tanks lined with self-sealing liners for a non-metallic self-sealing fuel tank. However, at the end of the day, the minor increase of speed was unsatisfactory and below the U.S. Navy's standard requirements for 1943. The U.S. Navy received 450 of these aircraft before the orders were canceled. As the plane reached service in March 1944, the SBD Dauntless truly became obsolete and was relegated to trainers, coastal patrol, 
target tugs, and hack planes for spare parts. An additional variant that is known to exist was the photo reconnaissance versions of the early aircraft. I can't find much information about them, their equipment and service history, but the designations were SBD-1P to SBD-4P. It is also known that SBDs were tested with a Douglas design DGP-1 twin Browning M250 caliber gun package. It seemed to be seldom used in combat, as I can't find too many readings about them. The patent for the guns was produced in 1944, and the design would be applied to SBD-5 and 6 aircraft. These guns would be equipped instead of the bomb or fuel points under the wings for additional ground support firepower. In June 1943, the Navy tested a new underwing ordnance, the 3.5 inch non-explosive forward firing aircraft rocket to be launched from aircraft to puncture holes of submarines on the surface. As these were fairly accurate, it was decided to be used for anti-shipping purposes as well, but needed an explosive punch. An updated version of this rocket was tested and implemented by attaching a 5 inch anti-aircraft shell to a 3.5 inch rocket motor. Being put into service in December 1944, these were used on Dauntlesses, Avenger torpedo bombers, and F-4U Corsairs. However, the rocket suffered from a slow rate of speed, so its later, more famous replacement, the 5-inch high-velocity aircraft rocket, was developed. It is documented that the British received nine SBD-5 Dauntlesses for evaluation. Known by the British Royal Air Force and Fleet Air Arm as the Dauntless Mark I, the design was heavily tested but was eventually rejected as both services were not interested in new dive bomber aircraft at the time, and it was deemed vulnerable to fighter attack. The Royal New Zealand Air Force would acquire 18 SBD-3 and 23 SBD-4s. Moderately successful in the Pacific, the New Zealanders would replace these aircraft eventually with F-4U Corsairs in 1944. The Free French Navy also acquired Dauntlesses for their use, 80 SBD-5s and A-24Bs for training and close ground support. These would be used post-war as well as during the First Indochina War, being removed from combat in 1949. Chile, Morocco, and Mexico also acquired the SBDs post-war, with Mexico being the last to fly the aircraft until they retired in 1959. By mid to late 1943, it became clear that the Dauntless's inability to fold its wings became a pain point for the U.S. Navy. As the new Essex-class and Independence-class carriers came into service, substantial air complements became critical. The Grumman carrier planes, such as the Avenger torpedo bomber, the F-4F Wildcat, and the F-6F Hellcats later on, were able to fold their wings for better storage, with the SBD being the odd duck of the fleet. Even though not a huge improvement in the dive bomber department, its replacement, the Curtis SB-2C Helldiver, would feature folding wings. The SBD was soon relegated to land-based operations with varied success, mainly with the U.S. Marines and Army. Eventually, dive bombing would be phased out as fighter bombers became more prevalent in the later years of the war. Nearly 5,800 of all models were built throughout its production history. The success of the SBD Slow But Deadly Dauntless during the opening acts of the Pacific Theater in World War II would solidify its hero status and as one of the most legendary dive bombers of all time. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. Let me know what plane variants you'd like to see covered next and what planes you'd like to see covered in their combat histories.